Good to see you all today. I think I recognize everybody in here. <laughs> As you know, I've been around about 45 years here in Howard County. I know that doesn't count for many people who have been here much longer than that. But I, it's certainly been my home for the second few thirds of my life. And yes, I'm an environmentalist. I had a company for 30 years that did a lot of environmental cleanups. And, um, but I've always had this love for the outdoors, and so I've also taken a few walks around the county. I think I've, I've walked, gone on about 3,000 different walks over the years, which is kind of shocking when you think about that. <laughs> but um, I did want to talk to you today about my, my, my pandemic hobby, uh, and hopefully I can share some insights to the history of this area with you. So most of my work in the past is, is encapsulated in couple of my books, which we have over here, which are pretty much a natural history of this area, or of the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, but I'm always out there looking at stuff. And so I also look not just at animals or geology, but also all the ruins and all the old pathways, and all the holes in the ground, which are unnatural. And so my mind always gets going, what the heck was that? Uh, and there's a lot we don't know. And it always shocks me when I go on a hike and I've done a number of hikes where I lead people to go with me, and they say things like, oh, I've been down here dozens of times, I've never seen that. And so that's why I enjoy working with people on taking walks and trying to understand what is all around you. This guy looks pretty indignant, doesn't he? His bill-headed woodpecker. Uh, and I think it's, to me, he, he represents a lot of things. One is, Ned, shut up and take a look at what you're doing. You know, <laughs> focus in on something. Uh, what are you doing? So a couple questions always comes up or, you know, this pandemic thing hit us in different ways. But are you any different today than you were three years ago? I think in some cases we are. And so it's a different perspective on life. And the thing that I kept coming away from with all the challenges of the last, well, not just the last two or three years, maybe the last decade, is when I'm in front of a group of young people and they attack me and say, Ned, you ruined everything for us. You're giving us the verse, you know, you're handing down an awful future to us. And I kept thinking, well, this is not the first time we've had lots of problems in this, history, in this area. I mean, I think every generation says that. I know I said that to my parents when I had to hide under the desk in school and there was nuclear war potential. You know, and I know in 50, 1957, we had a pandemic where we wore masks, and I had to stay home from school for a week or two. Anybody remember that? It was 57, 58. It's interesting. What the, it was after the polio, you know, polio was being kind of solved by that time, right? We had the vaccines. But you, you look it up if you have any interest. Uh, so whenever I come, I come to a place like this to say, who's my audience? And I, you know, I think I kind of know some of you, so I know a little bit about this audience. And I'm trying to focus my remarks more on the history than anything else. But it's all connected, isn't it? Um, so I'm here to share what I know and maybe inspire you a little bit to think in terms of your own history and your own lineage and your kids and your, those generations and try to say, is there something there that I know that I want to preserve to other people? Uh, I think we're losing lots of our, our knowledge up into the cloud, and you have to know where to look or what to ask for to find it again. Okay, so I'm kind of going to be talking about Central Maryland. I'm calling this uh, the history of two rivers as a little bit of the background, and we'll go off from there. Next slide, Megan. And we've seen this old uh, typewriter that's up here at uh, Last Slice, I think it is, on Snowy River Parkway. Um, so, Ellen asked me a couple of questions. One was, what's your process of writing non, uh, fiction versus nonfiction, since I've done both now? Uh, and I think the first thing in either case that's so important to me is understanding a sense of place, where you are. And many of you have probably been here for some time, but when I do this to a general audience, it seems like 80 or 90 percent of the people in the audience moved here, or immigrants from other states or other areas. But how about you guys? How many of you were born and raised in Howard County? 
That's the best I've seen. But still, that's only 10 or 15, isn't it? So the rest of us are immigrants, invading, invasive immigrants. <laughs> Okay, certainly creating a sense of place, I find very important. Um, collecting the facts. Now, facts and fictions are always kind of a challenge, right? That's not new either. But it's very important to try to separate those two in different genres. Um, creating a story that all could relate to. I mean, I couldn't write a book if, I were, if it wasn't relatable to me. I mean, because it's, a, <laughs> it's very hard to write a book. Let me tell you, this one took three years. Uh, so it's a, a challenge, and every, every time I had to go back to edit it, I had to read the whole thing again, you know, so it's pretty challenging. Um, and one of the big differences here is I chose, not, I chose fiction to write this collection of history up because I could make composite characters up. If you look at a family tree, there's all these pieces of information, all these names, some have a one-line sentence or maybe a uh, very short, so no one person captures it all, but if you make a composite person of my grandmother and your grandfather, <laughs> you know, and we can kind of start saying, okay, what happened at that period of time that gives you a sense of what it was like. I mean, history is great, but it, the more engaging we make it, the more people will understand it, I believe. And I always try to address the questions that I have that are social, economic, environmental, in my characters. I want to figure out some way to say, how did this really impact this person? And what did they do? It's like the whole idea of not being able to judge somebody if you haven't walked in their shoes. I, I created characters, and then I challenged them with a series of incidents that made them think and react and make a choice, good, bad, or indifferent, in their lives, which all impacts us today. Next slide. Okay, sense of place. Well, I often deal in the concept of watersheds. Um, but certainly these are some of the major rivers in the Piedmont of Maryland, which all are somewhat similar to each other. The Piedmont ones are where the water is cascading down so you can capture it in, in a mill or in a water wheel. Um, and that happened west of the fall line. You all know what the fall line is? It's that line where as you drive east in Maryland, you go from the igneous, metamorphic hard rocks of the Piedmont dropping off into the coastal plain of the eastern shore. So the fall lines where you have a series of waterfalls, basically. And it's also as far west as you can sail a boat. So it was a great place to build cities. And you look at the major cities in the eastern United States, they're all on a waterway or the fall line, like New York and Newark and uh, Wilmington and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington and Richmond. They're all built on the fall line. So we came sailing in from Europe, and we wanted land accessible to the water so people can bring sail ships, boats in and out. Um, and then we started expanding from there. And this is one uh, definition of where things were. These are geological or archaeological sites, all these things. And at this point, the Native Americans had been pushed west uh, because of disease and because more and more uh, Europeans came in from this area. Uh, next slide. I'm really blocking you guys. <laughs> um, it's an interesting representation of the Native American uh, status about the time of the first contact. And this is put together by their descendants working with the uh, Maryland Arts Council. And so this shows two of the main groups in this area, the Piscataway peoples, their use of words here, uh, which are mainly a coastal plain, you know, flat lying area uh, for farming. And then the next group, Aiden, uh, were the Susquehannocks coming down from the Susquehanna River, and they were mainly in the Piedmont area. So there wasn't a lot of habitation right here in the center. But there certainly were tribes coming through back and forth at different times using this area as hunting ground. And of course, if you really want to go back like 10,000 years, what was the Chesapeake Bay like 10,000 years ago? There was no Chesapeake Bay. It was just the Susquehanna River continuing all the way through Maryland and out on the continental shelf about 
100 miles. And so most of the Indian encampments after the last glacier age are underwater today. They would have been down close to the rivers. And now that's all been flooded as ice caps melted and the ocean level came up three or four hundred feet. Okay, next slide. I see some question marks in your eyes, so write down your notes. And we'll have some questions later, Q&A later. Okay, yes. Okay, where's my man Carl on the... Okay, should I speak louder or can you turn it up? Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for that, I appreciate it. It is a voluminous space here. So here's kind of a picture of Baltimore, and we, it's bounded pretty much on the south by the Patapsco River, and on the north by the Gunpowder Rivers. And so those are the two rivers I'm going to talk about a little bit today, because that's where I've spent all my life. My first 20 years was on the Gunpowder over in Joppa. In fact, you've all driven right through the family farm, if you've ever taken I-95. Um, is that better? Am I speaking louder? Just keep going like this if I'm not. Okay, so we're going to be talking about a little bit down here and a little bit up in this area. Next slide, please. Okay, so I basically have had this relationship with nature for quite a while, and um, I pretty much walked and waded and swam and kayaked and canoed up and down that river quite a few times. And I've photographed it, uh, I've written about it. Uh, <coughs> So it's one of my main touchstones. LPT happens to be my younger daughter, and she had an internship here once at Living Classrooms down in the, uh, the flooded part of the Patapsco River, you know, the harbor area. She was a first mate on one of the mini, on the mini V, I think it was, which was Skipjack. So she came home that summer, stayed there, and my wife and other daughter were someplace else. And so we made this agreement with each other that we would, every Saturday morning, get up, go out and walk for three or four hours, and then come back and write down our observations. And that was my beginning in writing. That was about 20, 2000. And uh, she hasn't published anything yet. I keep waiting for that. But really, it gave me enough interest in writing at that point to continue doing so. OK, now NFT happens to be my grandmother who um, was hired by my grandfather to come down and be BG&E's um, public relations manager. He had called up there, asked for the best PR man, and the, and the guy laughed, said, our best PR man is a woman. So, so, so he hires her and immediately thinks he needs to be the guy that takes her out, introduces her to the city of, of, of Baltimore. So they got on the trolley every weekend and went to the end of the trolley stop. And uh, pretty soon, I guess they were courting, but uh, you know, they did go to, uh, 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 what's the one on the east side of town? North, uh, Northridge, where the British landed? North Point, that's right. Uh, they went there, they went to Electric Park, uh, they came out here. And so that was one way for her to, him to introduce her to their business uh, goals. Uh, but what was interesting to me was, well, that's an interesting story, but you know what, how they did this. They went out fully dressed in long dresses, and he had jackets and ties on and hats, and they would canoe these estuaries. They would go shooting, uh, shooting uh, skeet shooting, and they would hunt for rabbits. They came up one estuary and portaged over to the, another estuary. Um, so it was like, I just couldn't picture that until I started reading about it. I thought it was pretty fascinating. We'll get back to her. Okay, my goal then was reading these things, saying, well, you know, everybody has these stories, and often we forget them with time, or the homestead is sold. You know, so what do you do? So I wanted to encourage myself and all of you to think in terms of what's the best way to save your family stories and actually get some benefit from them. Um, yeah, what was it like back then? You know, I keep thinking, walking around on our paved streets, uh, like in old Ellicott City, it was all muck, right? That's why they had that upper walkway, because it was all manure and mud in the streets. Yeah. Well, back then, I guess we didn't know better. It was better than not having the flat road to walk on. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. 
so in my search for what it was really like, uh, my wife's an artist, so we often go to museums. And so I'm starting to look at, you know, ships and dates and things like this. And I found it fascinating. I mean, just think of all the perspectives people have on these boats. These boats brought them here, first of all, which was either good or bad, depending on where you were coming from. Uh, it was, uh, but they were also these magnificent things that made you be able to live throughout the year. You could, you could sell, sell your goods to them and you can buy things from them. So if you had a frozen in bay like that happens sometimes, you don't get ships coming in for weeks or months at a time. And so you're kind of at your own skills to be able to live through those times. So it's really fascinating to actually see these boats. Uh, and then the other thing here is, here's those muddy streets in front of that building. And you see all this, I'm going to use the term crap. That's not very fun. <laughs> all this manure and, and all the waste products from everything slipping down, slopping up down into the, uh, into the water. So I, it must have really stunk, right? And the whole concept of washing somebody's feet, you know, comes to, you know, you always have to be washing and cleaning up probably. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of impacts, right? When, when the Europeans and Africans came over here and settled this country. Uh, this is a picture from the Susquehanna, but I mean, we denuded the whole Eastern United States and then we started progressing across the country, uh, cutting down everything to rebuild the British Navy, to create shelters, to create uh, heat, uh, to create furnaces. But just look at this. This is like tens of thousands of trees clogging up the Susquehanna. Next slide, please. And as we started producing more and more, we started building more and more industrialized systems to process it. Uh, that's a pretty sophisticated grist mill right there. And I remember as a kid actually taking bags of corn to a grist mill uh, just in the 50s. And of course, the wood was the first major product that we moved around. The second thing was tobacco, right? Once you cleared the woods, you could raise tobacco, and that was a cash crop. We addicted most of Europe to, to tobacco. Um, and the other major thing were the, the ores here, the mines. We, uh, iron ore was, we were the second largest exporter of iron on the planet. Uh, we ended up uh, sell, selling most of it to uh, Sweden or England, places up there. And then we discovered chrome, there's a major chromite mines in this area, copper. Uh, now we have big quarries of marble and quartzite and uh, black gabbro or riprap. And so there's a lot of refining and smelting going on that really built the, history, the powerhouse of Baltimore in the last 150 years. Kind of all went away when I came along, right? All the environmentalists shut down those places, uh, shut down my father's plant. I didn't do it personally, but uh, they were so badly polluting the water that it was very unhealthy to live in this town. And by cleaning it all up, it's been, a, been good, but it was an economic engine for a long time. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so you know, it wasn't just uh, like a city, right? It was, look at all the dams along the Patapsco, some, I think, 30 or 40 of them. So it was an industrialized valley. Uh, Next slide, please. And without many of the trees that we had then and, and before then and today. So how more trees here in Howard County than it was at different times in the past. Have you all seen this picture? No. I think this is from the, Ed, do you know, is this from the uh, Historical Society in Maryland? Uh, it's a great picture. It's much bigger than this and you can expand it and shrink it. And you can come down to city blocks. It's a fascinating way to actually, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm showing it partly because this is when things started changing from sail to steam by in the late part of the 19th century. But you can see these steamships out here and mixed in with the sail. And you all know the significance of this back in about the time of the Civil War. So this is, a, this is Pratt Street, which connected the two railroad stations which stopped on each side of the town of the city, I think because they didn't want cinders in the city to burn them down. Um, but what's interesting is, so they had a, the passengers and the, 
I guess maybe even the rail, uh, the cars had to be towed by uh, horses back and forth between the stations. And this is also where the first uh, shoot up of the Civil War occurred, when the Plug Uglies came and shot the Massachusetts regiments as they came through town. Anybody here descended from the Plug Uglies? Anybody would actually agree that they came to? <laughs> Plug Uglies were a group of, I don't know if you call them politicos, but you know, the votes were pretty, we think we have problems today counting votes. Back then they had a lot of problems counting votes. And so the city gangs would influence that quite a bit. Next slide, please. Okay, so we had a two or three hundred year history of exploitation. I mean, that's what we do, right? We, we need to live, so we dig things up and shoot them and grow a, grow a big country out of exploiting the natural resources that were here. Uh, and I'm not judging that. That's just a natural thing that happens. But what's interesting is that shifted from purely exploitation to restoration and preservation, starting shortly after the Civil War, when John Muir and other people started writing about the West and how we were destroying things with overgrazing and overexploitation. Um, and so here locally, we, we were fairly progressive. We came up with different easement processes to be able to save farms and homes and scenic areas and places that are healthy for us today to hang out in. So this is the Brown sisters uh, when they were young. I had the picture of them when they were old, but this is probably a better picture. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but anybody remember the big poplar tree when it was in front of the uh, Mount Pleasant? Um, damn it, I don't have a great picture. If anybody has a good picture, I love it. But That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, so yes, that was 232 acres that was preserved for a great purpose. I mean, a lot of you have probably enjoyed going there. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a side view of Mount Pleasant. And the first time Jim Clark took me out there to look at it, I was kind of speechless because I felt like I was at home. I grew up in a house very similar to this, built around a log cabin over in Joppa. And so while I was losing that farm, I was able to devote my energies here. I wish I could have saved them both. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a picture of Good Endeavor, which is the name of the book, which no longer exists, but which had a pretty interesting history over time. And notice the fire I have burning this photograph. That's supposed to suggest something. That we, that we lost it. Next slide, please. And had a couple of huge barns on it. Uh, initially, it, it was used for, well, this is one of those Piedmont farms, right? Because most of the early settl settlers were on the coastal plain, growing uh, tobacco. And then once you cross the fall line up in the Piedmont, uh, there was uh, tobacco initially, but it shifted pretty quickly to wheat and other grains. Um, and so they had big barns for storing all that stuff. Next slide, please. Not the Brown sisters, but Jim and Joyce Tillman, my parents. Homage to them. Is that okay? Homage? Next slide, please. Okay, here is some nine year old kid painting the fences, right? That's me. And uh, my memories, I think Ellen asked me to do some of this, is just say, share some of my memories for the last 70 years. But all, what I remember is a lot of fence painting, fence fixing up, uh, sheep shearing. Anybody here shear sheep? It's the hardest job I've ever done. I mean, my back is still a mess 50 years later. Uh, I was, I do have a, a, something I'm proud of though. In, in 1965, I was the second best swine judge in the state of Maryland. <laughs> That's not in the book. <laughs> but I remember corn picking parties, pig roasting, hay baling, horse shows. We had a hundred horses show up one year. It just blew my mother away. Uh, turkey processing. We first moved to the farm and it had a thousand turkeys on it. And Thanksgiving was coming up. I'm sure that was stressful. Um, tree planting, tree selling. Here's my father's business card from that era. 
and he's selling anything he had, bird breasted bronze turkeys, lamb, ducks, dogs, cats, whatever we had, he would sell. The next slide, oh, there he is, cutting up the turkey. Okay, but this is what happened over there, is it happened to be a bad location in the long term. And that I-95 came through and cut the farm in half. It surely messed up the economic model that he had before that. Uh, but so here's what I woke up to, and you know, this was a m very emotional time. And I think probably turned me into an environmentalist, uh, partly because I get to be outside, but also uh, trying to do better planning uh, in the future. I don't know how many of you know, but there's this nine foot diameter uh, water line from the Susquehanna into the Baltimore City as a backup line. They've used it a couple of times, but uh, I think it's been dry most of the time. I used to ride my bike up and down inside there. And we shifted from the hay, you know, we had much less land to grow our grains on. Uh, we shifted to having to buy a lot of grain to raise animals. And farmers are pretty resilient, aren't they? <laughs> Dad was so mad at them that the first thing you want to do was put a barrier up between us and the railroad, I-95. So he bought 35,000 trees. And the family spent many, many Easter's uh, <laughs> planting and pruning trees after that. Uh, so we had this belt protecting us from the highway, which I noticed the other day they're starting to cut down. But they, you know, 60 foot tall trees now, which you do these things not necessarily for yourself, do you? You do them for future generations. The tree farm, uh, it was in Joppa. It was, as you go north on I-95, as soon as you cross the Gunpowder Rivers, it's on your right and left. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay, so the gunpowder, you may know less well than you do the Patapsco. So I'm sure some of you have been to Pretty Boy and, and Lock Raven and the different reservoirs over there. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the Jerusalem Mill which is a neat place to visit. It's just a few hundred feet from the Jericho Covered Bridge, which again is a pretty neat place. And this is just upriver from where the farm was. You could easily walk up there. It's also a beautiful river. And this is the mouth of Joppa Town now. Now the history of Joppa Town, two birds, uh, was it was uh, the queen of the northern Chesapeake and from about 1700 to 1770. Uh, it was the county seat of Baltimore County then, though it's in Hartford County today. And uh, it, it was a, very, a bustling port until they cut down all the trees and tilled all the ground and planted all the tobacco and lost all the topsoil and the siltation into the bay, like many, many other rivers around the bay. And so what is now, it used to be the port is now, it's all, you know, it's just a bunch of motorboats, right? Uh, but you can see back here all this siltation. This, whole, this was all open water at one point, and now it's all silted in, it's shallow, and it would have to be a lot of dredging. Not that Baltimore doesn't get dredged every year, it does, but Baltimore was a deeper city, a uh, deeper water port. The previous slide, you talked about the Pretty Boy Reservoir. Yes. What does that mean? Huh. Pretty Boy Reservoir. Anybody have an idea? Pretty Boy sounds like somebody with his. Horses or oxen, but I don't know where it comes from. I've talked to horses like that. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, so Jaffa Town, two words, disappeared. And they actually took a lot of the building materials with them to Baltimore to help build what was the county seat in Baltimore at that time, down near Jones River, Jones Falls. Okay. And the names were interesting, right? Joppa, Jericho, Jerusalem, those are all little towns right around that area. Um, so I don't you know, they all come from the Holy Land, the names, but I don't know any more of the history than that. What's that? Yeah, and I mean, that's where Palestine is now, right? I mean, the, the, the major names, yep. Okay, um, so here's Joppa down here. You can see all the marsh land that's filtered in since then. Yes, next slide. I mean, Joppa, you say all roads led to Joppa. 
you know, when it was the county seat. And uh, evidently, initially, it was an Indian trail uh, where the rangers, like Ranger Brown, you know, would try to keep pushing the Indians west. Next slide. What's interesting is Good Endeavor is right on Philadelphia Road, what we call Old Philadelphia Road today, an old Joppa Road, uh, an old Post Road. Um, but there were interesting incidents in the Civil War and Revolutionary War, and even going back to Captain John Smith as he came to this area. I walk over here so you can hear some of half the talk. <laughs> Should I be louder, even, even louder? Okay. Okay, next slide. So what was interesting to me, and I hadn't done this until this talk came up, trying to compare the two rivers. Uh, they're very similar. Both Piedmont rivers, fall line on one side of them. The Platts, almost the exact same year, 19, no, not 1695, the Platts of both of those. Uh, and they both were dependent on the ports, Elk Ridge for, for this area and Joppa for that area. Uh, to me, they both log cabins on a hill. You drive up to them, it's kind of a pretty nice setting where they are. Um, and they had these additions with time. Uh, they did have enslaved and indentured labor. Seemed to be more indentured labor farther north you got. I think it was in some 90% or 80% was indentured labor up there. Maybe down here was the high, uh, more enslaved labor. But you know, these people were not just enslaved, right? They did things, they contributed a lot. They helped build the roads, they built the houses. They, they farmed. Some were very talented in some of the construction that they did. They dug wells. They probably built the additions on the, some of the buildings. And the differences in the histories is partly because of location, partly because what those rivers were used for over time. I mean, certainly the Beano Railroad going through Howard County made a huge difference to accessing markets. Uh, and they had similar challenges. Next slide, please. OK, so that's kind of a setting, right? That's a, trying to give you a feeling for a sense of place. Collecting the facts. Go ahead. We all have something like this, don't we? Even it only goes back a generation or two. It's um, a lot of names, kind of fun to see the names. A lot of little tidbits. You know, this guy died in, at sea, and this guy died out west, and uh, n not many complete people. And you only hear a little bit about them. I mean, all of us, look at us, we have all these different personalities, right? But if, if the story, if you, had, if you did something that was pretty neat, and somebody else did something neat at the same time, I'd build families around that. You know, I would put you both in a family. And uh, so I'm down, I'm not even on this. This was done before I was born. <laughs> Again, my grandmother, we mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things she did in life, she got interested in this kind of stuff in the 30s. And so we have books and these sorts of things from, from her. But it's interesting, go back, it's not just Tillman's, it's the Nelson's, it's the Otis's. You know how many people you descended from just in the last 10 generations? Have you done that geometric calculation? 10,024. Isn't that kind of incredible? So we might be related. I don't know. Next slide, please. And then they give you more and more detail. Typically, they start with somebody that stayed in England or Europe, and then the next generation migrated. Next slide, please. OK, so the types of things I was able to collect, largely from my family and relatives, but also other people that they knew, other stories. Uh, and I used a lot of that to create the people the characters and the setting. And well, the setting's pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, so Bibles, letters, photographs. I don't know how good my Latin is, but spes elite agricolum, which means hope sustains the farmer. So, hmm, let's think about that. My name's Tillman. I guess my relatives must have tilled the earth. That makes some sense, right? Uh, we have this family genealogy with that coat of arms. Um, and my kids are farmers, and my grandkids are farmers. They're not serious farmers, right? They, are, they, they grow a lot of stuff. Uh, they have supported themselves for years on some farming. Okay, then some of the books that were written about uh, coming over here. Town Hall Tonight, 
Does that ring a bell? Have you ever been to a town, town hall meeting? Yeah, that's all we do in our town halls, right? But back in the day, before television, before radio, we had all these traveling troops coming through. Some were burlesque, some were vaudeville, and many were dramatic. And so my grandmother was one of those folks which I'm not sure that it gave a high standing or a low standing. Circuit. Oh, I'm in a church. I shouldn't mention this. She ended up write, writing a book about her childhood. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, she did pass down a, a cotton veil that says vote for women on it. Um, she was a suffragette. We had other abolitionists in the family. Uh, had all these different types, guns and swords and uniforms without any story connected to him. I felt like something was lost there. Uh, wooden oxen yokes, leather horse yokes, track tacks, a whole variety of things. Next slide, please. So when the family farm was sold, our, our touchstone, our linchpin to the past kind of disappeared. The house is burned down. It's now a sea of suburbia. Um, there's a lot of stuff that started boiling up in my stomach about how do we save what we knew happened at different times. Uh, the earliest published record was this book by uh, a great, great, great aunt of my grandmother's, uh, 1859, about the trip here from Europe. Um, I, wanted, I started looking at all this stuff, and I wanted to tell a bigger story. I mean, I don't really care. I like, I'm interested in like ancestors. We were about three or four generations back. I don't know them. So I don't care as much about it's my ancestor. I, so I pulled in other stories too to make it, to enrich it. Uh, I really wanted to know how my ancestors might have dealt, or how our ancestors might have dealt the moral challenges of their time, which turns out to be very similar to the moral challenges of our time. That's another thing I learned here. Next slide, please. Okay, the mystique of family stories. We all have these stories that we know about this much about, right? And every time I hear a family story, it's changed. So, and like I asked my sister to review this book, and she has a different memory than I do. So I think this is a challenge we all face when we think we're doing, you know, trying to pass down facts. Uh, but there's certainly a mix of, beliefs in my ancestors, or our ancestors. Um, you know, they, all, they were merchants, they were farmers, they were sailors, uh, mainly landed in between James River and up in this area. Uh, they fought in the different wars. Um, and the most intriguing one to me was the talk my mother always had about how a sea captain used to own this farm. And he probably buried something here. <laughs> And of course, you know, none of us ever dug it up, except until the book came along. So next slide, please. So this is my grandmother when she was young. She, uh, her mother died at childbirth. She was picked up by her two aunts who, who, where she grew up. And from age five to age 11 or 12, she was on the road the whole time with a troubadour, a troupe of dramatic actresses and actors. And she wrote this book later. Next slide, please. Here's the troupe. Here's my grandmother. Next slide, please. See how dressed up they are? They were dressed up for going up and down the Rocky Mountains, these mining camps. It must have been a real mess, but they always looked pretty dressed up. The pictures I've seen. Yeah, here, some of the towns they visited out west, a bunch of the plays they produced. And through this process, she became kind of the marketing lady for the troupe. She would draw all the, the, the pictures and the sketches of the, what do they call them? Guard bills or something? Playbills. Playbills, yeah. Uh, and she would be writing a lot, so she became quite a writer. Ever heard of the jet set? No. The smart set? This was edited by H.L. Mencken. He spent time here in Baltimore as well as New York. And so she has a number of things published in there. That was supposed to be, what, teens, 1915 to 1920, I think. Next slide, please. And she published things in newspaper. This is when she was living in Detroit 
and took a train over to Buffalo for World's Fair or something. And here she is. She sketched all these women and the old man chaperone in the background. Next slide. I'm just going through these because this is one of the stories, like many of the stories you have, we have bits and pieces. And it's all engaging. The question is what's fact and, what, and which one makes you get a sense of what it must have been like. Yeah, I felt like I was breathing life, breathing air into these people's souls, maybe, right? And I just let them run with the story. Next slide, please. So, yeah, my whole belief is we need to tell these stories. We need to be able to relate to the stories. Uh, and I think they really give, not just us, but our children and our, and our grandchildren, a real sense of place and a perspective on pandemics and wars and politics and debates and fights and killings and all that. Um, nothing new. Uh, hopefully we're getting better at this. Next slide, please. So these are some of the challenges I thought were, I focused on in the book. Vigilante justice. Again, that happens today quite a bit. Uh, fragility of democracy, freedom and equality. Uh, and, you know, it's all kind of driven by what? By population growth, right? The more and more people you put in a box, the more and more challenges we have. Next slide. Oh, this is from 1917 pandemic. Next. Okay, I keep looking at the same clock and it hasn't shifted since I began. <laughs> what is it? Quarter one, so I can slow down at this point. I can wrap it up. <laughs> what time do we start? At 11.30. Okay, quarter one. Okay. I've earned my keep, right? I can stop soon. <laughs> okay, so the themes that kind of came out of the book was this whole idea of the tenacity of the, of the average immigrant. What does that mean? I mean, a lot of people fail not because of them, right? So you learn to be tough, but it was very hard. And I try to portray what I thought the middle class average American might be like. I don't really care about the upper 1%. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's upper and the lower 1%, which we hear about quite often. Um, OK, that for me? <laughs> I happen to think my family is full of these strong women. I don't know about you, it's a dangerous thing, but I had to write about that. Uh, love of the land. The, you know, for Tillman's, love of the land is pretty critical, I think. At least that's the story I tell myself. Um, but I think our relationship with the earth and the land has changed dramatically from totally dependent on it for your produce to now you don't know where your produce comes from. So we have to think in terms of how do we keep that in mind in everything we do. Importance of family and community, importance of empathy, and the fact that, you know, I hate to tell you, but all of us have evil in us, and all of us have good. I remember cutting off somebody on the highway the other day. I think that's kind of evil, because it could have caused some problems, you know? So uh, these choices we make are significant. And I was curious how what choices made in the past had any impact on us over time. What would you have done in the same shoes if you had been in their shoes? OK, next slide. OK, so writing a book is easy. You just sit down and write it. You better not do it unless you're really committed. And you have a couple of things all coming in that's something you think is very important to get out there, and something you also think you can get people to read. There's a kind of difficult changes. But yeah, so you have to decide on genre. So my first two books are nonfiction. Last two books are fiction. Uh, you guys describe the setting. You have to create composite for nonfiction. I mean, for fiction. Boy, that's hard. For, for fiction, uh, you get to create composite ancestors. You get to breathe life into dormant names on a family tree. Uh, you can infuse them with the personalities of people you know today, right? Um, because you and your sister, you and your brother would not have done the same thing at the same time necessarily. Uh, and I try to, you know, I let the characters tell the story. And then one pandemic and three years later, 
the book's done. That was last week, it came out. <laughs> so, based on a real place, based on many real events, characters represent a composite of people and explores how people may have dealt with the moral issues of their time as insight for us today. Next slide, please. There's much we can learn from each other, and it's a lot we can learn from our ancestors. Uh, and I actually have more of a conversation with my ancestors now after doing this. What the hell would you have done in this case? And this is the last slide. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh. I, you know, it's interesting. Over the last 20 or 30 years, I think people are much more in touch in some ways. Maybe it's just because my people I hang out with have gotten older. Might have been. Um, but we, there's a lot to learn from nature. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not hawking a book, right? But I, I, I'm not taking any money from this. Any money is generated goes to environmental causes. But I do want to say how important I think it is that we all do study the past and we gain some perspective. And there's a lot of, you know, my kids just don't have the time to read anymore, you know? But uh, I hope, hopefully they'll read this. <laughs> So I think this is a way of having outreach and inspiring others to think about issues which are so important today. So I hope you get a chance to read it. And uh, please let me know what you think. Question back here. Where it was burned down is part of, it, part of the demolition. Yeah. And quite frankly, it was ready to, you know, it, it was the log cabin had been settling. And so every time we came in the back door, it had to do one of these things at the back door. My parents, I would say, lived there, well, they lived all their lives there. So uh, they, they, it should have been fixed up, was the other option, which might be very expensive. Any other comments, questions, experiences? Yes. I can be honest with that answer. <laughs> My father spent money with a lawyer trying to stop I-95. I mean, that's, oh, reroute it. Yeah. It turns out it went through, well, I won't say, it. I won't go there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's eminent domain is what they do. And it's interesting because I use interstates a lot. But, you know, Eisenhower's plan has resulted in 47,000 miles of interstate. And guess how many destroyed ecosystems and communities? Tens of thousands of communities now are separated by it. You know, so it had a major impact, both good and bad. We were spoiled being able to have a house in the middle of 100 acres, right? And everything we saw was ours. And all of a sudden you have a million of your Best friends going in the backyard. <laughs> it was it was shocking. Yeah. So what's happened to the property now? There's there are two different sides. Is it still one farm on two sides, or is it all off the development? Or? They took what was on the other side. So the you know the, the road was by twenty acres, and then the other side was twenty acres of woods and stuff. But the road took up a lot of pasture. So they didn't take that. I think they would have taken the whole thing. Uh, what we would have loved to have done is to preserve the land, but we did not have the easement structure that you have here in Harris County. So there was no easy way to do that. And so it all became a part of the suburban sea of houses. We don't talk about this much at home. Very painful, yes. Well, the Brown sisters didn't really donate the land. There was a negotiation with, not I guess the heirs, the relatives, to buy it where the state would buy some of it for the DNR, the county would buy some of it, uh, 
which is still there. And then the rest would be given to the conservancy. And so the conservancy didn't have to come up with a lot of money, but the state and the county did, and we managed the whole thing. We. I haven't been on the board for 15 years. <laughs> Yeah. And we always gave notice. Uh, it was in the county and they donated. Yeah. Yeah. Any more? How about over here? This this I didn't even hear me talk. So, any questions? Planning any more CA walks? I would love to do more CA walks, and uh, neither of us broached each other for the last three years because of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, maybe by next year we we'll get them going again. If you like them, call CA. Maybe encourage them. Yeah, these were walks that CA had me do what like twice a month in the springs and the fall, and we had anywhere from twenty and thirty up to eighty or ninety people come to us. Uh, the biggest shock I had when I did a hike here in Ellicott City uh, for PhD, and one hundred and fifty people showed up. That's a hard walk to lead. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you could hear then either. <laughs> but evidently, this is going to be on YouTube, right? Probably pretty soon. So, uh, if you want to pass that on to other people, that's great. Yes. Bulls Lane. Yes. Now, people in Hartford County know Bulls Lane because they came up and bought a thousand turkeys every year. They came to horse shows, and Dad sold three or four thousand Christmas trees. You know, so, so people would come back for those reasons. So, uh, but that was twenty years ago. So, I'm speaking there shortly. I'm going to find out who comes out. <laughs> okay, what do you think? Good. Thank you. Thank you.